Well, thanks everyone, and and please interrupt me, shout over me if you if you have questions or submit a question to uh, uh, to Carrie, um, and uh, she'll she'll uh, get my attention, try to answer them because it's better if this is interactive. I can lecture for probably I could probably lecture for a couple hours on this topic. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, whiskey is a very broad topic, so come on, uh, shoulder. We'll get we'll try to get a little bit of background about. But exactly whiskey is, and, you know, we'll get you some party trivia type things like last time we talked about vodka and we learned about, you know, the James Bond tie into that. But uh, there's there's a lot of history to whiskey and, and a lot of factoids that, uh, you know, as you're enjoying your whiskey with with friends, you'll, you'll be able to to kind of uh, have these uh, these items, these trivia items at your fingertips. So, but before we before we get into whiskey, let's just get a quick review of what we went over last time. Um, starting with the first topic is safety, alcohol safety. So uh, just remember that when you're serving people, uh, you're, you to keep track that and know the standard uh, sizes for a drink. So the standard drink sizes are a 12 ounce beer, four ounce wine, one and a quarter ounce of 80 proof uh, liquor, which most of what you see up here is, is 80 proof. Uh, most most uh, distilled liquors that you buy in a liquor store are that. Uh, but there are some liquors that are 100 proof or even stronger and that the standard drink size for that is one ounce and most people depending on their their size can metabolize one standard drink per hour safely uh, and drive and uh, if, if not then you got to be able to uh, and, and if they're if they're drinking faster than that you can be able to slow them down or make sure that they're that they're safe um, and uh, by the way, most of the drinks we're making have more than one standard size, because if you, if you pay attention to the ingredient list as we get into the drinks, some of them are potentially two or two and a half standard size drinks uh, for these. So if you, if you have one or two of those, that's, that's uh, several hours. So uh, be cognizant of that when you have uh, guests. And uh, if you're a commercial bartender, your backstop is your bouncer, but when you're when your uh, your guests or your friends, you got to be a little more tactful and, and uh, clever about how you how you slow them down. So um, the other thing I want to review real quick is the five clears. Who who knows what the five clears are? Anyone? Okay. In the interest of time, the five clears are gin, rum, tequila, triple sec, vodka. And then the other one to remember, along with the five clears, are whiskey. And uh, the reason that's that's kind of a, a, a good thing to know is that if you get with the kind of the basic level uh, of, of uh, uh, brands for these, for about $100, maybe $120, you can make up dozens of drinks. So these, these drinks will cover a whole lot and satisfy most people's tastes. So, uh, like we did last time, I'm going to kind of take some of this stuff away as we so that we can see the stuff that's, that's behind. And you notice there's less, we're starting with less stuff on the table than we did last time because we're more, more focused on the topic here. Um, so the other, the other quick thing I wanted to review with you is the free pour technique. And the reason that's important is that it gives you a handy way to measure your drinks because Drink consistency is all about making sure that you have the right proportion. And this is a good way to measure uh, the, the alcohol that you're pouring uh, without having to constantly use uh, measuring cups or, or, uh, or stop. You know, so if you're making drinks for a bunch of people, you can make them quicker. And once you get good at it, it's a reasonably accurate way. So again, you can use a metronome to get your technique down, but uh, this is, it's dependent on the type of pour spout that you use, the shape of the bottle, and um, that, that will determine how fast it comes out. And so you got to kind of time your count, and as you get good at it, you'll get accurate. But again, a standard, best way to practice this, this is water, and you, you, I recommend that you just practice with water in, a, in an empty liquor bottle uh, with the pour stop that you would normally use, and just practice. So the standard is a four count. One, two, three, four. And if you do it right, you're going to get one ounce of liquor. So I would recommend do it in a, a um, glass that you can't see. So it's a blind pour. And then measure yourself and see how accurate you are. And that's not bad. Um, right, Almost right at one ounce. 
So uh, I know I'm calibrated. And by the way, so that that's your facsimile for vodka, just water. When you get into trying to practice with whiskey, it's a little trickier, but not much. You can make practice whiskey, which is with what this is. Uh, this in particular is just whiskey mixed with some coffee extract that I found in the in the cupboard. Uh, you can probably use vanilla extract or anything that would approximate the color of whiskey. So if you want to practice with with whiskey, um, you can do that and just food color it um, to, to make it look like whiskey. So this bottle of Jack Daniels is our practice bottle that, that we'll that we'll use because uh, I'm not going to drink. If, if we get if, if we get through all the drinks, I'm, then we're going to try to make. I'm not going to drink all of them, so um, we won't waste it. So um, that's the kind of the, the review. Any any questions before we go on? Okay, so uh, let's get into whiskey. So the very first thing. Right, and here's where you start to get into a little bit of trivia, but this is actually fairly important. The very first thing, it doesn't get as basic is, who knows how to spell whiskey? Do you spell, do you spell it W-H-I-S-K-Y or W-H-I-S-K-E-Y? And it's a trick question because both spellings are proper. You can, you can use either of them, but there is a connotation behind the spelling of whiskey. And there's a lot of stories if you go out there on the internet as to which one is which and where they are and what what is what and a lot of them are true but the most compelling story i found for the difference is actually has its roots in marketing uh like as in a century and a half ago marketing um so before the mid 19th century there was no such thing as or very very rarely would you see whiskey spelled with an ey so it was all W H I S K Y, and at the time the Irish, and so that's what that's another reason why the the uh, the folks on this call will appreciate the difference is that uh, the the Irish were kind of the premier producers of whiskey in the world um, at that time. So let's just bring it to the, the American context: pre Civil War versus post Civil War. So pre Civil War, uh, the 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 uh, mid uh, 1800s and prior, they were the 800 pound gorilla in whiskey production. They produced tens of millions of gallons. Uh, the biggest distilleries would produce four to five million gallons uh, versus Scotland at the time. The biggest distillery in Scotland, Glenlivet, was only like 200,000 uh, gallons of whiskey per year. And most of those distilleries in Scotland were like 100,000 gallons or less. So by far, Ireland was the biggest whiskey producer. Um, now, when they when they uh, came over to the United States, the United States wanted to well, whiskey producers in the United States wanted to kind of uh, well. Let me back up. At at that time, they're in the mid uh, 1800s. The Scottish uh, they were masters of marketing, and they also found a way to to make whiskey uh, cheaper and faster through blending. So. They started to beat the Irish at their own game, and you know, uh, the biggest uh, Irish distilleries, including Jameson, I heard someone had some Jameson early, there were two Jamesons, John Jameson and William Jameson, uh, two other distilleries in Ireland, got together and said, hey, wait a minute, this is nonsense, blended whiskey is not whiskey, we're going to differentiate ourselves, we're gonna, and we're going to market it, and we're even going to change the spelling. So the Irish started spelling their whiskey, W-H-I-S-K-E-Y. All right, and then over in America, the uh, people, uh, Irish whiskey was the premier whiskey. And not only was it just, the there was the most of it, but it was also considered the superior product at the time. And so American, uh, pe American distillers wanted to latch on to that name to, to command the premium. So they started spelling their, whis their, uh, their whiskey with an EY. And so that is the most compelling story that I've heard that it actually has marketing so I can and, and money, so I probably believe it. And there's an article out there, it's actually a Forbes article, Whiskey versus Whiskey and Why It Matters. So if you Google that, you'll you read the whole thing of what I basically just told you. Go so, marketing, go yeah. marketing. Pardon me? Go marketing. Yes. Um, wait, I, sorry, I changed the settings okay. for That's Zoom cool. and I can't, we can't do chat. So. If you guys have a question, we all know each other. Just yeah. say, hey, John, I have a question. So I was just going to point out 
that uh, or ask if you were going to talk at all about the Whiskey Rebellion, which of course happened right here in Western Pennsylvania. And if not, we'll save that for another day. That, I, I had read a little bit about that. And so that was all about a tax thing. So who loves tax, right? <laughs> so that the, uh, the, the, my understanding, I mean, fact check me on this, um, but I, I believe that is what it, what it had to, to do with is that, uh, Whiskey, whiskey was very lucrative. Uh, American farmers, uh, that was how they grew a substantial amount of their income because it enabled them to, number one, preserve their grain in a way that's very durable uh, years versus grain that's spoiled. Concentrated, it takes 11 bushels of grain of any type to, to produce a barrel of whiskey, and it increased the value. Well, the IRS wanted in on that, and so they, they taxed a lot, they, they taxed whiskey uh, very heavily, or actually this was even, I think this was even before the IRS came along, right? This was, was this, was this the Revolutionary War thing? Yeah, back in the day. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, it, it was. Um, it was in uh, 1791 to 1794, so actually it was kind of a, a way to try and close the, uh, <laughs> pay off the deficit more or less. Yeah. But it, but it was extremely unpopular, I know that, and so obviously led to the, the Whiskey Rebellion. And centered right here in Western PA, so just to point that out. Yeah, good, op good observation. So, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting piece, piece of history as well. Um, and uh, there's, there's more. So um, that's, just the, that, that's just the spelling. Okay, so what, who knows what the most important ingredient in whiskey is? Is it rye? Okay. Water. Water. Good. No. All good guesses, but it has nothing to do with material. The most important ingredient in whiskey is time. Okay, because the the all whiskey is aged to some extent, and it, it is in fact that aging process that gives it its color. So that that brown or, or caramel color, the aging process is how that gets that. Right. Uh, and so the. The, the most important ingredient is in fact time. Uh, now there there are a number of ways that you can make whiskey, and we'll also get to that. That's the other thing that differentiates whiskey um, is the, uh, the really the, the, all these different types of whiskey worldwide. There's two things that make them the type of whiskey that they are. One is the geography in which they're produced, and the the second is the uh, the grain that they're distilled from. Yeah, I have to try to drink all these things on the plate tonight. And, uh, the, the, and secondarily, there are requirements around to be classified as a certain type of whis whiskey. There are requirements around where it's produced, what type of material it's produced from, and how long you age it. So those are all those are all factors. Okay. So um, just in terms of just a a, a real quick uh, how how is it how is it made? There's four steps. There's mashing. There's fermentation. And all liquor, uh, all alcoholic beverages go through that to some extent, even beer and wine. So even, even when you're making wine, if you, the, the mashing there is washing the grapes. Well, mashing here means taking the various grains that, that whiskey can be made from, grinding it up, adding water to it, and that's your starting point. Uh, you boil it, and then, then they start the fermentation. Then they distill that product to a certain level, and whiskey is distilled at a lower point it, of alcohol content than other types of alcohol. So um, some whiskeys are distilled to a very low uh, uh, alcohol content before it's um, before it's bottled or aged and then bottled, and then ultimately bottled. And then the aging process occurs in kegs, and there's various types of uh, wood that are that are used for that. Um, but that's that is an important step. Is that all whiskey, the minimum you would see a whiskey age for anywhere is, is about two years, but some whiskeys aged for decades. Okay, so real quick, we'll go over the types of glassware that we that are typically associated with, with whiskey. So probably the, the most common or the ones that you'll see that you'll see the most is a rocks glass. And so this glass can be used with ice. Uh, it can be used with, if you don't want ice in your, gla your glass, they have whiskey stones, which take these, these cubical stones, they refrigerate. You can freeze these and put them in your freezer, put them in your glass. Uh, but my preferred way to drink whiskey is to just have it neat. 
right in the glass, right at room temperature, you get the, the native flavor of the whiskey. But um, this is the one you'll see pretty pretty often. It's a, it's a rocks glass. It's basically just a, kind of a, a, a short cylindrical glass, sort of short fat glass. Okay, these glasses are, are they're, they're sort of fluted. These are old fashioned glasses, and there's a reason for that. And it's it's a the, the old fa the the classic way to make an old fashioned is to muddle it. And an easy way to muddle if you have a fluted you know glass with a with a smaller bottom, it, it facilitates that muddling process when you when you do it. And we'll we'll get to that whenever we when we make a muddled old fashioned here. Um, but but that's an old fashioned glass. So here it's a familiar martini glass. Um, if you do your Manhattans, there's two ways, um, up, uh, rocks and, and straight up. If you do them straight up, a lot of times you'll see them in, in a uh, martini glass, which makes a nice presentation. If you're doing it uh, as, if you're doing your Manhattan on the rocks, you'll, you'll typically see it in a rocks glass. Um, this is a this is a sour glass. Um, there's you can you can put it in other types of glasses, but this is just the classic shape of a sour glass. It kind of looks like a short fat wine glass. Um, this is a this is a highball glass. So it's really roughly a, a, a cylindrical glass. It's it's a, a little bit shorter than a Collins glass, but same shape, roughly just cylindrical and a, a taller glass. So I heard someone had a, a highball. So I think uh, I think it was someone had a Jameson and, and ginger ale. Was that correct? Yes. That's an, yeah, that's an example of a highball. So basically, two, that's about as basic as it gets. The rum and coke of whiskey. Um, you know, it's it's just a highball. So uh, usually two ingredients. Sometimes you can garnish it, but that's a classic shape for a highball glass. And then one other, this is a snifter, and a lot of times you see these snifters, and I mean, this is a small one, but there are larger ones as well. A lot of time, most times you see these associated with cognac and brandy, but uh, people who enjoy really high-end whiskeys also use these. And the idea behind a snifter is it kind of lets the, it kind of focuses the vapors in so that you, you kind of get a very good nose with it as well. But- uh, They were also popular, uh chachi giveaways for senior proms in high school back in the day anybody else remember that snifters yep because you yeah exactly on them right okay yeah, yeah. and well, well i don't know when, when i when i came up it was shot glass collections were big so everyone would collect shot glasses from each other's universities and stuff like that yeah um, so I've got a number of Notre Dame ones. And so did they have like printing on, did they print on them? Like your, you know, class of whatever. And Exactly. No. Senior prom 19, whatever, you know, that was the thing. So they, they are, um, that's, that's what they're, that's what they're for. So it's a little more, um, you know, it's, it, it depends. Uh, they, they tend to tip over a little bit, a little bit easier. They're a little more fragile than if you got an all purpose rocks glass, but, uh, but they are definitely, uh, uh, you will see those used, uh, um, in association with whiskey, as, as well as the other uh, 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 liquors that I mentioned. So, okay, we're at 6:27. So um, we have uh, the number of we have a number of categories of whisk of whiskey. And what I did this this really gets into some pretty complex topic here. So. What I did was I tried to make a uh, Venn diagram. You guys remember these from when you're in school, and so I'm going to try to make it as as simple as possible. But I mean, like, there's a lot here. So you got the biggest circle is like distilled spirits. So in there, you've got four out of the five of your clears: vodka, gin, rum, and tequila. And then the, the big inner circle is whiskey. So W H I S K Y or E Y, however you <laughs> want. Okay, uh, and then in in that inner circle you've got like blended whiskey so there's a lot of different types of blended whiskeys but then in order to qualify for some of these outer circles there's some of them qualify and some of them don't okay and so there's there's a lot of different types so on these on these circles and i'll try to try to go through these uh, in as much detail as i as i can but i you know we can't spend too much time on it so we've got irish whiskey over here We've got Scotch whiskey. These do not touch. They're they're mutually exclusive. Um, obviously, based on on the geography, uh, there are blends of both. 
you have someone mentioned rye early, okay, earlier. Okay, and we'll talk about what qualifies as rye. We've got bourbon over here, which is, you know, the, Amer the American whiskeys tend to be made out of these two grains pr predominantly. Uh, and then you've got this thing that's almost kind of like onto its own, Tennessee whiskey, which is interesting. And so Jack Daniels is the, uh, the most familiar example that people would have with that. But there's, there, that is actually the most difficult to qualify as a Tennessee whiskey of the American whiskeys because not only, I mean, obviously it has to be produced in the state of Tennessee, but there's also a number of uh, other things that it needs to, to qualify in order to be categorized and sold and marketed as uh, Tennessee whiskey. Not the least of which is it has to go through a filtration process through charcoal. So, you know how like vodka, we said the most common way to filter vodka or to, to uh, distill vodka is to filter it through charcoal. That process happens with Tennessee whiskey. It's called the Lincoln County process. It was originated by Jack Daniels. And what they do is they take these giant vats and they fill it with crushed, burned, sugar maple from the state of Tennessee uh, that they that they cut down in the, the highlands of Tennessee and then it adds a lot of cost to the process because it's a very slow filtration so by the time they pour in the whiskey on the top it takes close to 10 days for the very first drop to fill her out through the bottom and so Jeez. that extra filtration step mellows the whiskey and that happens before they age it and so that's just an extra step and so again humble Jack Daniels is actually harder to qualify for than some of your other small batch rise and, and uh, bourbons that you'll see. So um, I'm gonna take a step back. And, uh, John, I think your dad's on now. Oh, hi dad. Hi. <laughs> now we got two people from Greensburg on the call. <laughs> two, are they two John Barsics? Yes. That makes it so dad and yeah. son. I just had a question. Um, how long did you say it takes to go through that filtration process before like the first drop? It, it can take up to 10 days. So when they, when they pour it in the top of the filtration, that's, it filters down through there very slowly. So yeah. I've read the Lincoln County process can take up to 10 days before they even get a single drop out of it. And then they just, they just let it run continuously. And it's probably being like at the Jack Daniels distillery or anyone else, any other distillery who, who uses, who, who wants to qualify for, Tennessee whiskey, they probably just have it dripping continuously. Right. Yeah, it, it adds time, uh, additional time and steps and costs to the process. So, mm -hmm. I think that would be a good trivia question for our next Notre yeah. Dame Live trivia. <laughs> Bonus points for being at a different event. Ex exactly. I think so. Well, Don't worry, I'm taking notes. There will be trivia questions based on bartending in the next trivia. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I'll well, still lose. Let's, let's back to some some Irish whiskey trivia here because that's the next, uh, that's another category. So we talked a little bit about the, the American uh, types of types of whiskey. Um, so Irish whiskey, that is also very strict to, in order to qualify for that. So aside from the obvious fact that it has to be produced in Ireland, it has to be made with unmalted barley, it has to be uh, made with Irish water, so water from the country of Ireland, which is apparently uh, has a, a low mineral content, so that adds another dimension to it. It has to be it has to be aged for no less than three years. So we said that oh. the minimum is two. Well, their minimum is three to qualify as Irish whiskey, and it's always triple distilled. So if and that's a, again, every time they distill it, they don't take the very first drops out of the out of the still. They don't take the very last drops. They take that middle cut. And so it's very select. It's 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 um, re they, they refer to it as refined whiskey. So if you look at your Irish whiskey bottle, and I think someone had had some. They, you have Jameson. Typically, you would see it, it would be uh, triple distilled. And someone else else mentioned Tullamore Dew. That's other. <coughs> this one's Bushmills. Those are kind of the big ones. There's there's right. others out there. Okay. So that there's there's a whole bunch of Irish trivia. Uh, Irish whiskey trivia, um, all of those different uh, things that, that you need to, to be to qualify as an Irish whiskey. Okay, and then um, as we said back in the day, Irish whiskey was the premier. They were the 800 pound rule in the world. They produced the, mo more, the most of it by a factor of 10, and it was regarded as the best until the Scotch came along and 
they uh, decided to, and they, they're very good with marketing, uh, and they started to beat the, uh, the Irish at their own game with whiskey until the, the Irish uh, distillers banded back together. Um, so with Scotch, obviously it has to be produced in Scotland. Um, it's not quite as restrictive as the, as the uh, criteria that uh, you have to, to be considered Irish whiskey, but a lot of the Scotch and why they are typically, uh, why a lot of them, especially the single malts, are more expensive is because they're aged for longer. So Scotch, Scotch is typically aged for 10 years or more. So 10 years, 18 years, some of them are even aged for 20 or 30 years before they're taken out of the barrel and put into a bottle to be, uh, to be sold. And so again, that adds a lot of cost, a lot of time to the process. It makes it much more rare. When you go through that aging process, you have a certain amount of loss because there's evaporation loss over the, over, over the course of many years. So not only do you, is that product take longer to, 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 uh, to come to market, but you also lose up to half of it by the time you get it there. So that's why scotch is expensive. That's why some types of it, the single malts that are aged many years are rare and thus expensive. Uh, and and that is, that's the driver of why scotch is, is um, expensive. And the other, the other big producers of a scotch type product, uh, the Japanese have tried for a lot of years to imitate that. And for as well as they did at basically beating the American auto industry at, at its own game, they have not yet been able to figure out how to uh, make a scotch as good as Scotland. So, but they're, but they're trying. Um, so that's, that's scotch. Um, and then the, the two most common uh, American uh, whiskeys uh, are, are bourbon and, and rye. And the, the, um, the main thing that you have to, to qualify for there is the, is the mash bill. So we talked about mashing being one of the steps of, of creating a whis whiskey mash bill is just the ingredient list. It's the recipe for the mash. And in order to be bourbon, that mash bill has to contain at least 51% corn. And for rye, it has to be, you guessed it, 51% rye. And that leaves a huge amount of wiggle room. I mean, but you do by federal law have to have proved that you have at least 51% in order for it to be labeled either product. But look at the, the room you have to work with there in the rest of the mash bill. So bourbons can be weeded. You can put other, you can have four grain bourbons that have um, all the different type, basically all the, everything you could possibly make whiskey out of can be in a bourbon or a rye, just in as long as it's less than 51%. So um, and this is before I forget. Does, does course, bourbon have to be made in Kentucky? It does not. It, it does not even have to be made in the U.S. So that's why this, when I tried to make this Venn diagram, it's, this, this is one that's not uh, geography dependent. Now, in order to be, I don't even know if it, you could, I don't even know if Kentucky whiskey has a, you know, they probably do have a, a thing. They're not as restrictive as Tennessee whiskey. Um, and by the way, Jack Daniels would be, if it were not for the fact that it goes through that, uh, that additional, um, Lincoln County process and you know it's almost like a thing to its own at least in the, U in the in the US this would be considered a bourbon because fundamentally the mash bill for Jack Daniels would be consistent with a typical bourbon so but so you're if you if you drink Jack Daniels you drink bourbon um, you're in a whole bunch of these circles in this Venn diagram if you drink Jack Daniels um, the, the two, and this is, if you are really looking to, to taste the difference between uh, bourbon and whiskey, and these two are very accessible. These, this is like, this maker's mark is around $25. This is bullet rye. It's, uh, this bottle I think is around $30. And um, th these, they all, bullet also makes a bourbon. But the reason why, if you really want to taste it, okay, so remember when I said that uh, bourbon really only needs to be 51%. Well, this rye goes way above and beyond. They, they claim that their mash bill is 95% rye. And Maker's Mark is a little heavier on the corn. They don't publish their mash bill exactly, but they're a weeded bourbon. So they are even more mild than a lot of the, the uh, corn bourbons that are out there. So when you taste these two side by side uh, with a clean palate, 
you will notice the, the difference between a rye and a bourbon. The bourbon is a lot sweeter and pretty mild, and the, the rye has a little more spice to it. It has a little more, a little more bite to it. So um, if, if you, get a, you get a rye, you, you might get a rye and a bourbon that taste almost exactly like each other, and most people could not tell the difference. Again, because in order to qualify as, as being a rye or a bourbon, there's a 1% there's a difference on either side of the line. But this one really will give you, that's a 95%. That's about as high of a mash content for rye as you can get. Okay, now we're up to, to 640. Um, let's see, is there anything else? So those are, those are kind of the, the biggest uh, differentiators uh, among these, these types of whiskeys. So again, it's geography, it's the ingredients that they're made out of, uh, it's time that they spend in the, in the cask, and they all, in order to be whiskey, they all have to spend time, at least two years, in a cask. Uh, in, in, the, in the wood, again, is what gives it its, uh, its caramel color as opposed to the clear liquors. Now, before it becomes whiskey, again, all, all whiskey looks like this before it comes out. And so this is, this is moonshine. And so moonshine, another name for it, a lot of, a lot of moonshines market themselves as corn whiskey. And so all whiskey looks like this. It's a clear product before it comes out. And again, it's, it's distilled to a lower proof. Most bourbons can only be distilled to 160 proof, which is 80%. Now that would be a stiff product to drink straight. And then they, they cut it down whenever they put it, they, they bring it down a little bit whenever they put it into the casks. And then when they go to bottle it, they bring it down even a little more by adding water to it or blending it with other, other products. But when you first get, out of the, the still, and there's two ways to, to distill whiskey. Uh, the traditional method that they use uh, over in Europe, Ireland, and, and Scotland, it's called pot stills. You may have seen them. They look like big domes like this, and they have kind of like a gooseneck uh, coming out of them. Uh, in, the, in the US, it's a more industrialized process. Uh, it's uh, column stilling, and so it's basically a two or three story tall uh, cylinder and there's a bunch of baffles and that's that's what they pour the mash down into it and then it, when it seeps back up through the heating baffles it uh, becomes distilled whiskey but it all looks like this regardless of what when it first comes out uh, when it uh, when it's first distilled and then it's just what happens from it's what the the cogener they call them cogeners and the cogeners are the impurities that come from like the type of grain that it's distilled from so corn Corn, uh, bourbon, the corn whiskeys taste a little bit like corn, that sweet taste. Um, and the, the other things they can be made out of scotches are usually made out of barley. Irish whiskeys made out of unmalted barley. Um, rye is made out of rye. Um, and that those, are, those are kind of the, the big ones. But uh, the distinctive taste flavors that you get are that just that residual co cogeners co that uh, are in the grain whenever they distill it. And because they don't distill it as high as, say, vodka or gin, a little bit of that flavor sticks with the, with the, uh, the liquor whenever it uh, is, is distilled and bottled, or distilled, aged, and then bottled. Okay, so are there any questions on uh, any type of whiskey or anything in general before we, before we go on? So I'm a little confused that they call it corn. I guess that's an, is that an element of the mash then? Or yeah. you said it was corn whiskey. Oh, yes. So the, the mash bill for corn whiskey. So there are, there are whiskeys that they just market themselves as, as corn whiskey. And yes, that would be the predominant um, ingredient in the mash bill. But it doesn't have to be 100% corn. It, it, it has to be, I, I believe, I'm not sure whether it has that 51% in the U.S., but I'm, sure, I'm assuming it's at least 51%. But um, bourbon, for sure, has to be 51% corn. So yeah, and all of those things that we're talking about when we talk about the grains are and the percentages that they need in order to qualify, that is the uh, minimum that they have to have in order to uh, qualify as those liquors on the mash bill, the percentages on the mash bill in order to qualify for those liquors. Does that make sense? Thanks. Yep. 
John, I just want to say a quick comment. I've muted everybody. So if you want to say something, just unmute yourself. I just try to cut back on the background noise. So yeah, if you're uh, wondering why, if you're trying to talk and no one can hear you, it's because I muted you. <laughs> just unmute yourself if you want to well, say something. Well, let's take, take the opportunity now then. Um, yeah. Are there, are there other questions about any, any of the topics that we, that we covered so far, whether it be types of whiskey? Um, is moonshine simply unaged whiskey? Basically, yes. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it, it would qualify much quicker than any other type of whiskey because there's no requirement to age it. So that's why moonshine is often clear because they don't take the step to age it in uh, charred oak barrels um, or charred any type of barrel. Um, they can just bottle it straight out of the out of the distillation process and um, much shorter path to, to get it into a bottle and into the market. And like, I lived in North Carolina for a couple of years and I heard that there was like the illegal whiskey and then the legal whiskey that you can buy in the liquor stores. Do you know kind of the difference between those two? Yeah, so the, uh, have you seen a show called Moonshiners? I think it, I can't remember what station it's on, whether it's a history yeah, channel. Yeah, like I'm that. not sure, no. So, you know, Moonshining got its, got its origins. I mean, it was, it was around before uh, prohibition, but I mean, it really got big in, in prohibition. But the difference is, you got to be careful with, with moonshine because it is not an industrially controlled process. It's, it's by default unregulated. That's why it's illegal. If you do not produce alcohol properly, uh, you you can you literally will go blind and you hear you hear that uh, you could die from from drinking it because it, it, it has to be the impurities have to be drawn off both before. So that, you know, when I talked about, you know, the when you're distilling Irish whiskey three times, and you can only get the middle part of that distillate. Uh, same thing with moonshine. When they first make it and they first start distilling it, the first, I don't know, gallon or couple gallons that come out of any still are no good. You can, they have to basically draw that off and throw it away. It, it does not, it has impurities and it, it has properties that would be poisonous. And so you can only get that middle part of the draw. And so you can, you, you, you got to pour off and, and discard the first part of the draw. And then uh, on the back end of the process, you can't run it all the way through until the still's dry. At some point you have to cut it off um, and, and get that uh, and leave the back part behind because that is also poisonous. So uh, if you do not do that properly and big distillers are, you know, they're masters at controlling that process and testing it and, and making sure that, that their product is safe. They have a vested interest in that. But if you're like a small one man operation, Number one, you're profit driven. Number two, you have a very poorly controlled process. Number one, because you don't have big capital uh, equipment and sophisticated equipment, and you might be an upstart, you might not know what you're doing. Uh, that's why it's dangerous. So that is the difference between like true moonshine, like illegally made moonshine and store-bought moonshine. There is the store-bought moonshine typically would be industrially produced, it's illegal, uh, and you know, if, if you are, if you do attempt to taste illegal moonshine, just be careful that you know that the person that made it knows what they're doing so that you don't get the, that front part or the back part of that draw from the, the from the uh, distillation process. Got it. Thank you. And there's all kinds of, like, if you, if you watch that show, there's an amazing number of, uh, things that they, uh, I mean, in addition to corn amazing number of things that they will put in their mash uh, and additives that they'll put in their mash to, to flavor moonshine. So it's, and that's why in addition to the risk of being illegal, uh, these are highly boutique uh, customized products. And that's, that's also why, you know, you see some of those high prices that they can get for those mason jars of whiskey that you see out there. Right. But, yeah. So. Okay, other questions. This is good. I like I like this because this is you know this is this is more probably you hopefully you get more out of that than than just lecturing than me lecturing. So any other questions? Okay, so um, we got 
about 12 minutes or so. We probably won't get to all, all of the drinks that, that we talked about, but let's try to get uh, through at least a couple of them. So number one- Maybe people and, could say what they were hoping to make and you could focus on those. Yeah, yeah so uh, who, who, uh, who has a drink preference? Michael Brooker, you said maple syrup. Yeah, let's do maple uh, syrup. That's maple like whiskey sour. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there's there's a whole bunch of ways to get there. Here is an interesting. That, that, that's that's why this is interesting. I don't have a regular bottle of Crown Royal, but I do happen to have a bottle of maple Crown Maple. That I mean, this thing is probably this is very old because. I, it's it's not a really a drinking whiskey. I think I bought this a long time ago when I was making pizzelles that had uh, whiskey in them. Um, my aunt's recipe and maple whiskey. Why not? So that's why I bought this a long time ago. But there is a a, a, a maple uh, product out there. Now you're probably talking about using maple, actual maple syrup to flavor it. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a couple ways to get there with a with a sour one is to use sugar just like regular table sugar and the other probably an easier way is to use because you know there's a, there's sometimes it's hard to get that those sugar granules to dissolve so and i know i'm cutting my own head off here but that's because i'm trying to bring the product up but there's simple sugar you can buy this in either a liquor store or the grocery store or you can make simple sugar just by boiling sugar and uh, Make, making it to its till it's like a thicker consistency and you can make simple sugar so that's one way of doing it or as as you're going to to do uh you can use maple syrup or really anything to sweeten your your sour with so the the shortest the shortest cut uh to, to make a, a whiskey sour uh is to use this though so there's there's sweet and sour mix so you can you can use this um and the the, the the, the shortest shortcut that you can do is you just take ice and put it in your glass, in your sour glass. And actually, before I do that, if you wanna get super fancy with it, you can do a sugar rim on it. So if you're, if you're using sugar, or if you're not using sugar in Michael's case, you don't have to do this, but just like you would do with a um, with a uh, um, a tequila with a uh, a margarita, you can rim your glass with sugar to just kind of give it a little bit of uh, of uh, decoration. Then you can put your ice into it. And then, depending on how strong you want it, typically you would use two ounces of whiskey uh, or bourbon or whatever your whiskey or uh, maple Crown Royal, whatever your whiskey of choice is, um, two ounces is, is, is typical. You can make them a little bit lighter. You can go maybe ounce and a quarter, ounce and a half, um, or uh, you can make them stronger. So it's, it depends on your preference. So remember, if you're doing a free pour, and again, this is just uh, water with, uh, it's my practice whiskey, it's just water with, in, in this case, uh, coffee uh, extract in it or vanilla extract in it. Uh, two ounces is eight counts on a, on a free pour. So two ounces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if you're good, that's two ounces of, of whiskey. And then the shortest cut, again, is to just use this uh, sweet and sour mix. And you typically would, would just pour the, the balance of the, of, you'd fill the, 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 your sour glass the rest of the way up to about that frosted line to, you know, a little bit below the rim so you don't spill it. So uh, we could, you could either do that or you could do what Michael's going to do. And uh, instead of doing that, instead of using this, you would use uh, lemon juice. So remember from last time we used roses, sweetened lime juice, but again, this, this is very strong. So this is what will give you your sour. So I'd recommend using no more than Two, ta two tablespoons of this. Uh, you may want to try it to taste. And then you can put in the uh, either the, the maple syrup, as you had said, or the simple, simple syrup like this. Or 
several teaspoons of granulated or powdered sugar um, uh, that, uh, that you can use. Uh, and that will give you the flavor. So I'm just going to do it the, the uh, quick and easy easy way with the uh, sour mix. And then this this glass has the kind of the nice rimming on it, so I'm not going to juggle them. But you can pour them you know pour them into a, a uh, glass like this and then strain it back into your into your ice. You know, kind of do one of these with it. You could just leave it like that and stir it a little bit with your straw. I do that. Um, you can garnish it with a lime or a lemon. In this case, I'm going to make the circular lemon slice. Put it on there. You can even gar you can even put a cherry in it if you want. So that's your. Um, that's your whiskey sour made the easiest the easiest way. And again, you you because those those uh, it, because those other types of presentations, this will give you a pretty reliable pour because this is sweet enough and it's balanced. It's this is what bartenders use as a, as a shortcut. But if you're uh, experimenting with your own recipe where you're using uh, different quantities of your lime juice. The lime juice, particular lime juice you use might be a different strength. You may, you could use actual fresh lime juice for that real lime stuff. Um, the, the type of sugar or the type of simple syrup or the maple syrup is going to give you differing amount of sweetness. So I'd recommend testing your recipe before you, before you serve it because this will please most palates when you do it this way, but th there's a wide range of results whenever you start to get outside of that. So just test it out before you before you serve those other ones. So um, any questions on whiskey sour? I have a quick question. If you were if you were going to use just lime juice, would lime juice and a sweetener, whether that's simple syrup or sugar or something, be all you would use? You wouldn't need yes. Any sort of ingredients. That's a, that's a good point. I forgot to mention when you're using lime lime juice and simple syrup, that volume is going to be a lot lower. So you're okay. gonna have to, you're gonna have to top it off with you can top it off with anything you can top it off with soda you can top okay. it off with any 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 mixer you want you can use orange juice that's that's again that's why this is a, a a shortcut because it has the appropriate amount of sour and sweet in it and it will fill your glass up without having to you know because the alternative is to put like six ounces of whiskey in there but that's, yeah. that's okay. gonna be terrible so yeah. if you want that glass to be full. Um, and you're not using this, you're going to have to fill it with either like a, you know, like soda water. Of soda or something. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of flavored soda. So, you know, this one's tangerine soda. You, you, you fill your glass with that and you, you also get a little bit of a sparkle on it. So that's. Okay. Um, Thanks. Yep. So um, here's a, here's a, so a couple quick ones and before we take the next request okay so we talked about highball uh because someone actually made one going into the uh uh presentation whether they knew it or not so highball is just whiskey again two ounces ounce and a half three ounces depending on how stiff you want it and the balance is any soda or liquid of your choice on top of that you serve it in a highball glass add a cherry to it if you want so um ginger ale and, and whiskey is one seven and seven um Jack and Coke would technically be considered a highball, so that's that's a quick one. Um, if anyone's been to like uh, steakhouses or anywhere where, well, actually, just in general, mules of, of every type has gotten outrageously popular in the past couple of years. Here's your shortcut for mules, and this this will get your again much like this mix, and this is not that expensive. But when you open it, it's sparkling, so you're going to want to use it within you know, a week or so, or otherwise it's gonna go flat, unless you don't care if it's flat. But this is Owen's uh, Craft Mixers. It's a ginger beer and lime. It makes a perfect mule. So if you were at like, uh, uh, what's the steakhouse um, where, they, where they feature them? Um, not Outback. Um, 
I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on that, but, but mules everywhere, this, is, this makes the, uh, the perfect uh, balance. Longhorn, I'm sorry, Longhorn Steakhouse. They have what's called the Montana Mule, which is a bourbon-based uh, mule. They make it with uh, uh, Jim Beam bourbon, and they use something like this uh, in their mix. I've seen the bartenders behind the bar pour, pouring a white liquid. That's what this is. But mules have their, you know, they, again, if you're going to try to make it with, uh, with lime, with actual lime and ginger juice or ginger, um, ginger puree, uh, again, you got, you're going to have to experiment with that because you're going to get different strengths and flavors uh, with, with that, much like you would with, uh, with your own homemade whiskey sour. So those are a couple, couple quick ones for you. Um, so we are, we are close to seven. Any other requests? Uh, for an old fashioned, how do you put the orange? It said you needed a yeah, whole orange. That's that's great question. Okay, so here's the thing: old fashions. There's a whole bunch of ways that you'll see it made nowadays. Very very few will you see it made like the classic way. So I had like when when I went to take this this class up in Rochester, the guy that was teaching it said he went to an interview once as a bartender, and they said he said I only have one interview question for you. Can you make me a an old fashioned the right way. And the, the classic way, which I'll show you in a minute, is was that's 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 very hard, hard to come by nowadays. Most of the time what you see is you'll just see, you know, just a, a, a little a little bit of garnish, um, whiskey with a little bit of fruit juice or something like that. They may dress it up. What I've seen a lot of and I was going to br bring this out to show you, you'll see things like uh, these large ice cubes that are made and the, the reason they make them aside, besides when that, that they look decorative in your old fashioned is that the, the ice melts very slowly because it's a large ice cube and make them, you can get them like easy small Tupperware containers to make a cube shaped one or they have these specialty ones, you pour water them and it will make you a ball shaped ice cube, a very large ice cube that melts slowly. It doesn't water your drink down as fast. So you'll see that at like high end steakhouses when they make you an old fashioned. But the, the real way to make classic old-fashioned or a muddled old-fashioned, you'll hear that term sometimes. Again, at the start, you said, okay, your typical glass for your classic glass for whiskey, American whiskey anyway, is a rocks glass. Looks like that's a fat cylinder. An old-fashioned glass is more fluted. Here's a more extreme example. It's very fluted. Here's a, here's a more subtle one, more like a typical old-fashioned glass. And the reason for that, again, to your point about muddling, so a muddled old fashioned is you will take your take your glass and you will some some uh, recipes for it will be just sugar and Angostura bitters, but a muddled old fashioned which you make with fruit will be your orange. So you use about a quarter of an orange or potentially a half of an orange if it's a small orange. You put it in the bottom of your glass. And then you take a, a maraschino cherry, stemless maraschino cherry, also put that in there. And then you're also going to want to put about a tablespoon of sugar in there as well, as if the orange isn't sweet enough. It's a very sweet drink. Um, or again, if you don't want that granularity or you want to make sure it dissolves, you can use uh, simple syrup, a tablespoon of simple syrup in lieu of the, the sugar. So when you do that, you muddle it. So you're going to take a blunt instrument like this, looks like a mortal and pestle. This is actually like a juicer, like an orange juicer. The other end of it is blunt like that. So you're going to take it and you're going to muddle your fruit and your sugar and everything in the bottom of the glass like that. And you're just going to, you know, make it, mash it real good, get it together. And then you just leave everything right in the glass, right like that. So make sure you wash your oranges before you do that because they're going to be left in there. Um, you can, depending on the recipe, add a dash or two of Angostura bitters. This is also, some people put this in their Manhattans, but be careful with this stuff. It's very strong. You can ru ruin a drink very quickly. So one to two to three dashes tops in an old fashioned or a, man or a Manhattan. Once you've muddled and added a uh, dash or two of Angostura bitters, if you want, then you get your ice in your glass. <laughs> Get a scoop, fill your glass, fill your glass with ice. 
And then again, depending on how strong you like it, two ounces would be about standard, but you can go heavier or lighter. So I'm gonna do an eight count for two ounces of, uh, in this case, Jack Daniels, my practice whiskey, but you can use any bourbon, any whiskey will go in it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Two ounces. And then for an old fashioned, you can top it off again with, with some soda. I'll borrow this straw. You can you can garnish it with lime. You can put some bartenders will leave that cherry on the bottom and put another one on top for good measure. So that will give you your your old fashioned. If you want to eat, I mean that's a very sweet drink. If you want it even sweeter, instead of topping it with soda, you can use your sour mix, and that'll make it even sweeter. So, but uh, there's your your muddled old fashioned. That's kind of the classic way to make an old fashioned. But again, in higher end restaurants, you're going to see it a bunch of different ways, and oftentimes you'll see those huge uh, cubical or uh, spherical ice ice cubes. Sometimes they'll drizzle it with like a a uh, uh, cranberry syrup or, or or some type of syrup. They'll pour that on top of that giant ice cube and it sort of just floats there and stratifies and it looks very nice. So same same thing. It's an old fashioned, but it's just the, the modern way to make it, I guess, modern presentation. Great question. Okay, anyone else? How's Michael's uh, maple whiskey sour? I say it's very good. Mimi says it's delicious. I, I made enough for her too. Oh, good. It's in the background. There's no wrong way. There's no wrong way. That's the, that's the thing that's nice about bartending, cooking and bartending. Now, baking has some science behind it. And if you don't follow the science, you end up with a flat cake or a terrible tasting cake for, for cookies. Um, but cooking and bartending, uh, there's a lot of ways to, to uh, to uh, customize your recipe. Cool. Okay. So Any other questions? We're at 7.05. Um, so, I mean, if there, I'll, I'll be glad to stick around if there's any other questions or you wanna see anything else, um, just let us know. <laughs>